We are in week three of a sermon series uh, talking about the path to peace. Uh, so just a three-week installment talking about peace and how it's important in our life and really just kind of looking throughout the Bible on uh, a couple different frameworks for what it looks like to have peace in our life. And in week one, we talked about the importance and the priority of having peace with God. The other, the other two, they don't even matter if we can't get number one correct. So we have to have peace with God. And then in week two, we talked about how can we actually have peace with others, people that might bring us difficulty in our life or uh, people that honestly we might look at in the mirror every now and then. So how to have peace with others. And then today we're really going to put some prioritization and some focus on what does it look like to have peace with ourself. Uh, and the whole theme of this message series has really been all about the idea that people are looking for peace in all kinds of different things or activities or whatever. Uh, and we're saying that that's temporary satisfaction. But really, these three weeks help us understand that really peace is not a circumstance or a scenario. Peace is a person, and his name is Jesus. And this has been what we've been unfolding. Um, I will just tell you up front, just because you came to all three weeks doesn't mean that you're going to forever have peace and never have another, another difficulty. Um, even if this is your first week here, you're not just going to have peace with yourself because you heard this message. Hopefully, you can have some tools that can help you. Uh, but this right here, this isn't really a path to a destination. This is more like a racetrack because this thing called life is something that we're continually on, right? And these are three things that we need to put a lot of attention and focus on. And it's our relationship with God. You know, we need to constantly monitor that and be prioritizing that. Our relationship with others, you know, not just because we heard it one week, have we, you know, everything's great. This is something that we're constantly going to have to work on because even if you mend relationships, maybe that have been severed or hurt, guess what? More pains are coming and you need to be prepared for those. And then today, we're talking about peace with self. So if you've got your Bibles today, uh, I'd encourage you to open up to Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to start. So that's going to be our starting verse. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, no problem. We got one in the sky as well. Uh, so Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, we brought this scripture out um, a couple weeks ago talking about this idea of peace that comes from Christ. So let's read it and really open up this sermon series about, or open up this last installment of the sermon series to to see what does it look like to have peace with myself. The Bible says this in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is the inspired, infallible authoritative and errant word of God. And Father, we humbly approach your word today. Lord, we ask that you would use your word for those of us who are here today that have a relationship with you, as the Bible says, to equip us and encourage us, rebuke us and correct us through your word. We're asking you to do that in our hearts and lives today. And for those of us who may be here that do not have a relationship with you, we pray that you would use as what Second Corinthians describes as the foolishness of preaching so that some can be persuaded or brought into a relationship with Jesus. I pray that today you would use this message to prick the heart of people that may be here that are either unbelieving or have slidden away in their relationship with you, that you'd call them back. Father, we thank you for your word. We don't want to hear from man's opinion today, but we want to hear by your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, when I was in high school, uh, one of the things that I did for some extra summer cash is I umpired uh, baseball and softball games. And I remember when I was, uh, when I was an umpire, normally I'm the one who uh, always got in trouble uh, because if fans didn't like what you called, guess what? They were going to let you know about it. And you are here probably sitting next to the person that is going to let every umpire know that they are wrong. It's the person that you came with that lets the umpire know, hey, did you forget your phone because you missed a call? Like they just have all of these little things that they like to tell umpires and they like to chat back with them, referees or whenever you go to a ball game. And I remember when I was being an umpire, I, you know, that was my first experience at umpiring. And I felt the pressure of everybody else's opinion on me when I was doing that. And I remember when I was umpiring, like I had a line uh, that I could handle, like I had so much grace, but then there was a line. And then once you cross that line, then I was doing the, the most fun thing that you can do as an umpire is not call balls and strikes or people out at home plate. The most fun that you could ever have as an umpire is saying, you're out of here, buddy, go to your car. I love doing that. That's my favorite thing. I had a line and if you crossed it, I just said, Hey, Buster to the car. Like, and that was it. And I could, and I, I had the badge and all like it was, it was serious. So they crossed that line. 
And I'd let them know that'd be enough of that. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is because the word guard up there, when it says, let the peace of Christ rule, rule, that word rule is in the original language, it's comparative to the word umpire. And what that means is, let the peace of Christ be the umpire for all situations that come into your life. So I want to start this message out by asking you, what umpires your heart? What, what is the filter by which when pressures and life circumstances, scenarios come in, what, what umpires that? Or, or a, a better way to say that is, is what, what allows things to stay and go? What is the filter for your life? Is it is it just your feelings? Is it your emotions? Is it the expected outcome? What, what filters your life? Because I want to encourage you, the same thing that Paul encouraged in this letter, is to allow Christ's peace to rule in our hearts. Now, now, how do we let Christ's peace rule in our hearts? Well, we can look at an Old Testament shadow of this. The Old Testament shadow of this was the high priest. And the high priest wore, wore a garment with a, with a breastplate, and it had 12 different stones in it. And the 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And tucked in behind that breastplate, there were two stones. And these two stones were used when the high priest was looking for a decision from the Lord. So the high priest would pray, whether they were to go into battle or whether they were to do something. The high priest would, would pray, and then within these two stones, one of them would warm up and the other one would illuminate. So there was warmth and there was light. And based which one, whether it went warm or whether it was illuminated, then the high priest knew whether it was a yes or a no from the Lord. And obviously, we don't wear a breastplate. We don't have those stones inside of our chest that we can just kind of look down. But you and I as believers, our stones, like the, like the high priest in the Old Testament, is the peace of God. So if you want to know if you should make a decision... Do you have God's peace about it? Now, time out. Let me just tell you that God's peace is different than your preference. Because a lot of us think that our preference equals peace. Because it feels good, it looks good, it's what we want. It's not the feeling of peace. Because I would imagine that Paul didn't have the feeling of peace when he was in prison. When, when he was awaiting execution, when he was waiting, awaiting all the beatings that he would occur... But Paul had this inner peace, and it's the peace of Christ that no matter whether he was in prison or in chains, whether he was in a ship being shipwrecked, whether he was bitten by a snake, why did Paul walk around with this peace that ruled his life? Is because he knew the peace of Christ. So this is just kind of the hook to reel you into this message, to tell you how important peace in your life actually is. And for you and I, as believers... This is not optional, but this is necessary. This is something that you and I need, not, not to live a life based on feelings or emotion, but based on, you know, Jesus, should, should I go to this school? Should I marry this person? Should we make this decision? How many of you right now, by show of hands, have a decision that you need to make about something and it's somewhat important? I'd say probably 85% of us right now, we're, we're constantly facing decision-making. And a lot of us, based our decision based on pressure and not peace? What does the pressure of the circumstance put on us versus the peace that comes from God? And if God gives you a peace about something, there's nothing that can shake you from it because you can look at a scenario that you're like a little fearful of, you've got a little worry, a little anxiousness about it, but yet when God's peace comes into that situation, it's like, let's make it happen because it's this overwhelming sense that God is with me even though this might not be the greatest circumstance that I've ever faced. How many of you want to navigate your life based on that kind of peace? All right, so we'll talk about some things that kind of steal that from us. I want to share with you two peace thieves. Look at your neighbor and say, peace thieves five times fast. Just say it five times fast. Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? That's fun trying to say. Peace thieves. Peace thieves. Number one, the number one thief of peace, what's going to steal your peace is anxiety. Number one is anxiety. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. So Philippians chapter four, six through seven, number one peace thief is anxiety. The Bible says this, Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. He says this from prison. No, he's in chains in a dungeon. And this is what he writes. 
Do not be anxious about anything. That for me is just very convicting that he's in chains, in a prison, awaiting execution, and he says, be anxious about nothing. I don't know about you, but if I was in his shoes, I'd be very, very anxious about what's getting ready to happen. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the number one peace thief is anxiety. Let's break down what Paul's saying here. First of all, this is a little bit frustrating because he says, do not be anxious about anything as if anxiousness is a choice. And that kind of bothered me when I read it, to be honest, because I don't choose to be anxious about stuff. It just feels like this stuff is just becomes overwhelming. Anybody with me on that? So when I read that, I was like, man, what in the world? So, you know, I reached out to some people that I knew that actually worked in the field of psychology. And uh, I reached out to them and I, I talked to them like clinical counselors that I know that I have relationship with. And I started asking them, these are believers as well. I said, hey, in your professional opinion, balance that with your spiritual relationship. Can you talk me through this? Because Paul is saying, don't be anxious. And I feel like, you know, anxiety might not be a choice. I've wrestled with it personally. You know, can you kind of help me? Because I'm trying to balance out this theological thing, but then also you've got a degree in this and you know the science behind it. Help me wrestle it down. And and I talked to, to three different individuals and they all said this, that that people that struggle with anxiety on a chemical level, is a very, very low percentage of people, very, very low percentage of people struggle with anxiety due to a chemical imbalance, even though it's always true. However, people that struggle with anxiety that are seeing psychologists and going through treatment and working with counselors, these are people who have just not developed filters to work on anxiousness. And I want you to hear me out and hear me very clearly. I myself have wrestled with anxiety, okay? So I understand from a realistic standpoint that anxiety is overwhelming. And what I'm telling you is that I encourage you to see a therapist. I see a therapist. I think that it's important. You should, I think everybody should have a therapist, somebody that you should talk to. And if your therapist prescribes you some form of medication to help you, I just want to tell you as your pastor, praise God. If there's something during this process of figuring out how to work through things, I pray that there is some relief and there's some help and that you're working through that, working through it with a counselor who has the ability to prescribe that to you as well. But as I was talking to them, I was really surprised by how many people actually don't have the chemical imbalance, but just haven't learned the coping mechanisms on how to deal with anxiousness that comes into their life. And I, I'm just telling you, I talked to people with more degrees than a thermometer this week. So these people know what they're talking about when it comes to this. And I talked to them about this idea of do not be, you like my dad joke, didn't you? You're just now catching that. <laughs> he said, do not be anxious about anything. And it struck me because it's a choice. And here, here's what the choice is. It's when you and I choose to bear something that was created for God to bear for us. You know, th think about how God describes us in the Bible as sheep. How many of you have ever seen a pack sheep? You've never seen one. You've never gone to a fair and seen a saddle on a sheep to give a ride. You've never seen one. Because sheep were animals that were never intended or created to bear a burden. But yet you and I bear burdens constantly. And what Paul is telling us, do not be anxious. Okay, Paul, thanks for telling me that, but how do I do it? And he, thank God he gives us a three-point outline. It's like Paul's a professional preacher or something. He says with prayer. Now, what is prayer? Prayer is, is conversation that connects me with God. So how am I going to deal with anxiety? I'm going to connect with God. Some of you, you're, like your worry list needs to become your prayer list and not your gripe list. Some of us, we go to prayer and it's not really prayer, it's a complaint. Now, I'm not saying God can't handle your complaints, but I'm like, when we're constantly trying to twist God's arm through prayer, that's not communion with him. And what God desires from us is prayer and connection with him. Then he goes on, so prayer, supplication, this is earnestly talking to God about what's going on. God, I need you when you see the word supplication, think of the word supply. God, I need for you to supply this because I am without it. And I'm not going to be able to get it unless you supply it. I'm learning this as you go through a building process. If the supplier is out of what you need, you're in trouble. Can I just tell you, God is not out of hope. 
He is not out of joy. He is not out of peace. He's not out of healing relationships or marriages. He's not out of that. So if God has it and he's the supplier, maybe me and you should kind of tap into that supplier. So prayer, you're preaching. Supplication. And then he goes on, he says this, with thanksgiving. That means looking at your circumstance right in the face and saying, I'm still going to give thanks to God despite what I'm facing, despite what's going on in our marriage, despite what's going on, I'm still going to give thanks. Think about Jesus and his disciples. When the disciples brought him the little boy's lunch pack and it had some bread and it had some fish and they had a crowd of over 10,000 people there and Jesus looks at his disciples and said, well, you feed them. And they're like, well, we don't have enough. They started cursing what they had. They said, well, we don't have enough, and we're going to have to go over here to the town and buy some food, and we don't have enough money. They started to curse what they had, and Jesus showed his disciples what you and I need to learn is Jesus took what they had, he broke it, and then he blessed it. He said, God, thank you, not for what I want, but thank you for what I have. And then when Jesus showed them the model of blessing what they had, God began to multiply it because God will multiply what you bless but there, there can also be multiplication in what you curse as well. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when you start cursing or not speaking well about something, it seems like it's the only thing that you can see. Start speaking negative about your spouse, and it's, that's the lens that you're going to see them through. Start speaking negatively about your children, about your church, about your this, about your that. That's what you're going to see. But if you just start blessing, God, thank you for my husband. God, thank you for my wife. Thank you for these children. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this. And just learn to start. God begins to multiply that. He'll multiply whatever you're seeing in it. So he says this, prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, letting your requests be made known to God. And then he goes on and says this, and the peace of God, the peace of God, and it surpasses all understanding. How many of you, you've ever went through some kind of a trial or some kind of a situation where there was no reason to have peace, but it's like in the midst of it, you just, you just had this overwhelming peace in the middle of a circumstance. It's because it's not your peace. That's the peace of God. How do I know it's the peace of God? Because it surpasses your understanding. It's peace that you're like, I don't even know why I have this. When you, when you are in a situation and you have peace and you don't know why, just thank God right there. God, thank you. I don't even understand why I have peace about this. They are driving me insane. But you have this overwhelming peace. It's because it comes from God. It surpasses all understanding. Then notice what it says. It will guard your hearts. How many of you are seeing now that it's imp- your heart is important? Right? We started off in Colossians and we said that we needed God's peace to umpire our heart, right? So now we're seeing that we need peace to umpire, but not only do we need peace to umpire, we need peace to guard. And when Paul is using this word guard, he's talking about a military term. And he's talking about a regiment of soldiers that would stand ready to offend any kind of subject would, that would try to encroach the territory that they've made a boundary around. So this is what Paul is saying, is that Christ's peace can, can umpire your life, which means strike, but like I'm umpiring it, but then Christ's peace also guards it as like a military guard, standing in opposition, waiting for any attack. And then it, it guards your heart. So this is your feelings and your mind, it guards your intellect. Because when your intellect rises above the peace of God, it puts you on the throne because it's pride. Your intellect should never rise above the knowledge of God. My intellect hides inside of the box of God's sovereignty. And anything that I don't know, I chalk it up to, "Mm, maybe God's smarter than me. And God's peace will guard me against the heart Because the Bible says this, your heart is desperately wicked. Who could know it? That's what Jeremiah said about it. And your mind. So God's God's peace guards my heart and my mind. Then John chapter 14, verse 26, I want to share with you a couple of scriptures in John that Jesus says about this idea of anxiety because it's such a peace thief in our life. Jesus says this in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. How many of you would like Jesus's peace rather than your peace? Aren't you thankful that he gives it to us? So Jesus gives us his peace as followers of him. And he says, not as the world gives you, do I give. So Jesus is saying, there's a vast difference between worldly peace and Jesus peace. What is worldly peace? It looks just like the world. What is the world? Temporary. 
So it's temporary peace in a circumstance. I don't want that kind of peace. That's the peace, like right now, the feel good peace. I don't want that kind of peace. I want the Jesus kind of peace that abides. And he says, my peace I live to you, I leave to you and I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid. So Jesus is saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't allow worry and anxiousness and don't allow fear to come into your life. And he goes on and says this, because I've prepared a place for you. And in my father's house, there are many mansions. And I go there to prepare a place for you so that you, where I dwell, you can dwell there also. You know what Jesus is talking about here? He's talking about the number one root of everybody's anxiety. And the, and the number one root of everybody in, everybody's anxiety is death. And Jesus has conquered death. So that's why he can look at his disciples and say, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let fear creep in. I've conquered death. There's, there's no need to worry or to be afraid of it. But you can actually stay. Why? Why can, we, why can we look death in the face and not be afraid of it? Because of what he said. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I don't know about you, but I feel a lot more comfortable in places where people have prepared for me. I feel honored. I feel taken care of. If I come to your house and you got me a little plate ready to go and a sweet tea, praise the Lord. You've prepared for me and I'm going to feel comfortable there. And guess what? Jesus prepares a place for us in heaven where we will be, be with him also. And I don't know why in church we don't talk about that a lot. This is the greatest news that we have as Christians is that Jesus has prepared a place for you and I in heaven to be with him forever and always. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus continues talking about this idea of peace. He said, I've said these things to you. I've said these things to you that in me, not in your stocks, not in your retirement, not in your house, not in your blank, but in me, in me, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. If you don't have peace, it's because you're not finding it in him. In the world, you will have tribulation or trouble. And I love how Jesus compares this. He says, look, you can either go with me or not. And here's going to be the outcome. As a parent, I deal with Amos all the time. You do have a choice. This one is pleasurable. This one is associated with pain. Choose wisely. And this is what Jesus is telling us. Pleasure or pain, you pick because something's coming. Jesus is saying, in him we can have peace. Because he promises us in the world we will have trouble. But he says this, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, I've overcome what's temporary. I've overcome what's temporary. So anxiety is a peace thief that I see. But the number two thing that I see is this, is comparison. If there's going to be anything that steals your peace, it's going to be number one, it's going to be anxiety, your fear about something. But then number two, comparison is going to steal your peace. Comparison will steal your peace. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 6, talking about comparison. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4. Pay attention to your own work. I'm going to put a pause right there because Paul just said M-Y-O-B, and I love it. He says, mind your own business. That's the kind of friend you need in your life right there. You need a friend in your life that will just look at you when you're coming to them with all kinds of complaints and gossip and all these issues and all this stuff about everybody else. A friend that will look at you and just say, I love you. Mind your own business. Because this is what Paul's saying. I just, I just made it plain to you. He literally said, pay careful to your own work. What do you think he's saying there? Mind your own business. That's what he's saying. Pay attention to your own work. And then notice why he says it. He says this, for then you will get the satisfaction. That's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for satisfaction. We're all looking for contentment. We're all looking for peace. And what's going to steal peace? Anxiety and comparison. So notice Paul says this, mind your own business and then you'll be satisfied. Let me give you a little, a, a little helpful hint because Paul just gave it to me. If you want satisfaction in your life, quit looking at everybody else. Quit comparing yourself to everybody else's marriage. Everybody else's money, everybody else's boat, everybody else's house, everybody else's food. Everybody, quit, quit doing that. Walking around with no satisfaction, with no contentment in life. You know what happened to me today? 
I was halfway on the way to church. And you know what I realized? I forgot my phone. And you know what I didn't do? Freak out and panic and squeal the tires to hit the brakes and turn it in reverse because I got to go back and get it. You know what I said? Praise the Lord. Because all that is is comparison on your hand. And it's attached to your arm. And you're looking at everybody else all day long and what they're doing and what they've got going on. You don't even post nothing because you're just busy looking at everybody else. And the stuff you do post, is, it's just fake. We know it's fake. You put a filter on it. We know it. You're not fooling nobody. Because we're, we're, we're putting out our highlight reel. And what we do is we compare our highlight reel with everybody else's highlight reel. And then we're wondering around why, like, why I don't have peace. And why I'm not satisfied in my marriage. And why I'm not satisfied with these kids. And why I'm not satisfied is because you are comparing yourself with everybody else. You want to know what the Bible says about comparing yourself? It is unwise. And yet we have it attached to our arm. Most of you right now, if you pulled your hands out and looked on your pinky, whichever one you hold it with, you got an indent on it. Feel it. You just surprised yourself, didn't you? It's a problem. It's a problem. You're not supposed to have a callus there. I'll move on. The satisfaction of a job well done. You're laughing because you found your callus. Of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to, I just liberated somebody right there. If you just came to church just to hear one verse, that's the verse that you needed. Then he goes on in 1 Timothy, another book that Paul writes, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You want great gain in your life? You want some satisfaction? Quit looking at everybody else. They got a raise. Just, just remember what Paul says. Mind your own business. Like if you, if, you, if you plaster any verse on your social medias or any verses in your cars or on your, on your mirrors or whatever you do, do that one right there. Just do M-Y-O-B from Paul. Mind your own business. A mind that is content with its lot. That's what the Bible describes as contentment a mind or a heart that is content with its lot. Your whole life would look different if you just started blessing your marriage. God, thank you for my wife. God, thank you that she's such a gift to me. She's the best wife that I'll ever have. She's the most beautiful lady that I've put my eyes on ever. Just start blessing it. God, thank you for my children. These are the greatest children I've ever met. Because when Amos is running around like a hooligan and I see other kids like actually sitting at a table eating a meal... My, my kids are feral. Like, what is going on? And I can choose to look at that, or I can say, you know what? You've never seen anybody hit a baseball like Amos, because you haven't. He, he'll, hit a, uh, he'll hit a ball farther than your three-year-old, because I'm blessing it. I just, I just see what he can do. I'm not, I'm not looking at what he doesn't do. I'm not looking at what she doesn't have. I'm not looking at what I don't have. I'm not doing that, because I don't want it to steal my satisfaction, because I'm going to bless what God's given me. So anxiety and comparison... Now, how do we actually do this? How do we fight anxiety? How do we fight comparison? Well, I'll give you two tools. Two tools to fight, fight comparison to kind of rid yourself of these peace thieves. These are locks that you can put on your door. That way those thieves can't come in your house anymore. Number one is this. You need to redefine peace. You need to redefine peace because our definition of peace is not accurate with what God's definition of peace is. And I'll just give you a really strong point. If your definition isn't what God says it is, you're in trouble. Like just go with God's definition on whatever the circumstance is because he's right and you are not. So God's definition of peace is peace that's found in him. It's contentment that's found in him alone. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter four, starting at verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need. So Paul's getting ready to talk to us about how to redefine peace. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content, content. So Paul's gonna teach us how to be content in every situation. Here's how he does it. He says this, I know how to be brought low. I know how to be humbled and I know how to abound. So Paul's saying whether I'm here or whether I'm here, my integrity is intact. And integrity is, is wholeness. You get in trouble when you don't have integrity, 
When you get down here and your character starts to slip, trouble. When you get up here and your character starts to get tested, you're in trouble. So Paul's saying, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. Then he says this, in any and every circumstance. So he says, from here to here to here, I know how to have peace. How many of you would like to say that about your life and about you as a person? Whether I'm here or here, I know how to have peace in every, in every circumstance. I have learned the secret. Circle that word secret. I love secrets. Anybody in here love secrets? Anybody in here bad with secrets? You tell me something, I'm gonna tell it. You tell me you're pregnant, everybody's gonna know. Just don't do it. Because I'm so excited for you that I just can't help it. I get myself in trouble all the time with that, that one specifically. Just don't tell me a secret. If you don't want people to know, don't tell me. Because I'm gonna congratulate you and high five you. I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mess. I love secrets. They're so much fun. So anytime I see learning about a secret, I'm gonna circle it because I wanna know how to, I wanna, I wanna know secrets. So I've learned the secret to facing plenty of hunger. I've, I, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then this next verse is not like a working out verse or not like a, 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 a you can do whatever you wanna do verse. Let's put it in context. What does Paul say? Paul says this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul is saying, I could be low, I could be high, I could be somewhere in the middle, but I'm going to stand the test of time because it's his strength that strengthens me. It's not mine. It's not the circumstance. It's not dependent upon that. It's dependent on, Paul's, uh, on God's grace. And Paul knew that. Paul had what, what he described as a thorn in his flesh, which meant that he just had some kind of something going on in life that he prayed about. How many of you, you've had or have something in life that you've prayed about and it's like, man, that's not leaving? that struggle, that addiction, that health thing, whatever it is, just like not leave it. Well, Paul had the same problem. And there's a lot of guesses about what it was. But nonetheless, it was a problem that Paul prayed about. And he prayed about it three times, the Bible says. And God says this, that my grace is made sufficient for you because in your weakness, then I'm made strong. That's God's peace guarding your mind because that doesn't make sense to me and you. That's, that's how God's peace, God, I'm still gonna trust you because even... In my, in my weakness, you're made strong. So in, in my lowest point, my most vulnerable point, that's how God is actually magnified in my life. Why? Because prayer, thanksgiving, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him thanks. I'm gonna give him thanks no matter what's going on. So we need to redefine peace. And here's the definition. Peace is not the absence of, tr absence of trouble, but it's the presence of God. What is peace? It's God's presence. That's why in worship, the enemy hates worship. Why does he hate worship? Because Jesus said, we're two or more gathered in my name there, I'll be in the midst. Jesus said, uh, the Bible says in Psalms that when brethren would dwell together in unity, that God would command a blessing there. So there's something about when we come together and we bless and magnify and lift the Lord, the enemy hates it because it refreshes us. How many of you were refreshed in worship just this morning? Just singing songs and just praising the Lord. It's because it, it brings us peace. Why? Because God's presence is attracted to praise. It's attracted to praise. God's presence is attracted to praise. So we need to redefine peace. It's God's presence. It's God's presence. That, that means you can be in a hospital bed and have peace. Why? Because you can have God's presence in a hospital bed. He's omnipresent. It means he's everywhere. Not only that, but he's in us. Thank God for the day of Pentecost. He lives in us. Madison prayed it. Thank you that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in me. That means I can have peace wherever. Why? Because he's with me. What is peace? It's his presence. How do you have peace right now? Well, God's here. Well, this is a terrible circumstance. Yeah, it is. But guess who's here? He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's here. Right in the middle of this. In the middle of this argument, he's here. So we need to redefine it. And then number two, we need to rely on God. Remember, we're not pack sheep. We're not meant to carry burdens. Jesus said this is... Like, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you feel like it's hard and heavy, you're doing Jesus' job. And you're not a very good Jesus. I love you, but you're not a good Jesus. Because it should be easy and light. How is it easy and light? Get into his presence one time. You want, you want that to come off? In his presence. You just find yourself, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, find yourself in his presence because I'm going to rely on God in the middle of this circumstance, in the middle of this trial, middle of this pain, middle of this heartache. I'm going to get into God's presence. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 26. 
Isaiah chapter 26, verses three through five. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. I don't know about you, but I want perfect peace. Like if there's peace and then there's perfect peace, how many of you want the perfect peace? I want the perfect peace. How do we get perfect peace? I love when the Bible answers itself. Some people just ask questions. The Bible already, the Bible already gives an answer. Well, how, how do I have peace? Well, is your mind stayed on God? No, there's your problem. How do you get your mind stayed on God? Thank him. Praise him. Worship him. Bring him into every decision. You don't need two stones in your, in your patch behind your breastplate. You don't need that. You've got the spirit of the living God living in you. So you just tap into that eternal peace. Well, pastor, I don't know how to do that. Do me a favor and stand with me if you want God's perfect peace. I'm gonna show you how to do it real quick. You do me a favor with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to take right now your most pressing situation. It could be your marriage. It could be your kids. It could be something going on at work. I want, you, I want you to think of it right now because everybody's, everybody's got a problem. That's the one thing. We all got belly buttons and we all got problems. I want you to take your biggest problem right now. I want you to get it in focus. I want you to think about it. All right, you got it? Okay, I want you to think about that problem right now. And then I want you to compare it to the cross. I want you to compare it to God's love for you. I want you to compare it to living eternally with Jesus in heaven. I want you to think about the trees that we see, the grass in the field. I want you to think about the most beautiful beach that you've ever seen. I want you to think about the Grand Canyon if you've ever been there. I want you to think about the biggest mountain you've ever been around. I want you to think about the lowest valley. I want you to think about a fish that you caught. I want you to think about God's creation. I want you to think about how big God is in comparison to this situation that you have going on right now. And I know your situation feels big. I know it feels like a mountain, but God's made just two ranges of mountains right here in the United States, not, not counting all the mountains across the world. God is way bigger than your problem. I want you to think about how great and how holy and how mighty he is, how strong he is. And then I want you to think about his love for you. I want you to think about what Jesus would say to you right now if he walked into this room. Because he would say the same thing to you that he told his disciples. Peace I give to you. Not like the world gives. I want you to think about that right now. I want you to think about your problem. I want you to think about the greatness of God. Then I want you to think about Jesus moving, coming in the door, walking through the aisles, coming to you, telling you to lift up your chin and looking at you in the eyes and saying, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I gave my life for you. Then Isaiah goes on and he says this, keep in perfect peace those whose mind are stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now I want you to think about you trusting in God. God, I trust you. Then it goes on, it says this, trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. He is an everlasting rock. Amen. Would you do me a favor and just lift up your eyes? One of the counselors that I was talking to this week, when, he, when they were talking about anxiety, they talked about rumination, and I didn't know what that word was, so I just I jotted it down because I didn't want to sound silly and ask him what that word meant. So I jotted it down and I Googled it. And it comes from this idea of a cow that would chew cuds. And I learned in the four, first service, they actually have four stomachs. So they'd chew the grass, it'd go back in stomach one. Then they would regurgitate it, come back, they'd chew it again, then it goes stomach two, come back. goes all the way through four stomachs before they digest it. And they said that that's what we do with thoughts is we ruminate on them. Is we get a thought and then we regurgitate. Think about it, just throwing up a thought that you've already tried to start, just throwing it up, bringing it back. And today, I, I want you in Jesus' name to, to cut that ruminating out. 
So whatever you're ruminating on, how can we set that to the side?